recording and this recording. So yes, I, I, I think, yes, I am ready. So let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to gather together uh, to study your word and to study in particular this very important topic. We pray now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak uh, through Robert as he presents your word. And uh, as we listen, that we will hear your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and help us to respond to your name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, so, Robert, it's over to you now. Thank you um, so much, Joy, for introducing me. Uh, and uh, yes, I hope it's okay. I am doing some uh, recording of this session. Um, what's recording, by the way, is just me uh, and my voice and just your voice. Uh, so I can put it on YouTube for for my channel, if that's okay with everyone here. Yes, that's fine. Um, so in this study, we're going to be exploring the topic of the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. And um, Revelation 13 has quite a lot in it. And um, the, the lesson, actually, which is uh, lesson 22 in the series, um, introduces a number of themes. Uh, firstly, going through the first beast in Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. Um, and then the lesson goes into Daniel 11 slightly, and then it comes back to Revelation 13. Um, in this study, I think, for me teaching it, I think it's more logical to uh, stay in Revelation 13 and possibly come back to Daniel 11 at the end if, uh, if that's how um, the lesson ends up going. Um, and uh, it also makes a point of uh, the 666 um, aspects of the prophecy in verse 18. Um, and then it um, summarizes with the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, identifying specifically the third angel's message, and the, uh, which is about the, not to receive the mark of the beast, and the second angel's message, which is to come out of Babylon. So there's really like quite a lot in this uh, in this lesson, and um, I think that if 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 I had been the one, by the way, to um, compile these lessons, I might have arranged the material slightly differently, because in Revelation 14, um, when we have the three angels' messages, it says there was the first angel, that was followed by the second angel, which was followed by the third angel. And so this, the message about the mark of the beast, which is in the, th the third angel's message, that's the last message, which comes after the first two messages. Um, so I would have like structured it slightly differently. Um, and what I'll be presenting to you today is sort of like um, a variation on lesson 22, um, adding in my like own material where, where I've seen fit. Mm -hmm. So... To begin, could I ask somebody to read for us Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2? Okay. I've got it here, so I can read it. Uh, can you all hear me? We can hear you very well, Joy. Okay. So Revelation um, 13, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New National Version. It says, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a, a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Thank you so much for reading. So, um... This prophecy introduces this beast, which comes out from the sea, has seven heads and ten horns. 
And I know, even though I haven't taught the previous lessons, I was having a look over uh, what the previous lesson, the content of the preceding lessons, and I noticed that this was covered in the previous lesson, in lesson 21, um, where in lesson 21, questions uh, 11 to 13 discussed Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2, and connected it with Daniel 7. So, uh, for those who were here last week, this is kind of ironic because I, I was not the teacher last last week, but um, um, uh, would someone like to volunteer to share their thoughts on this and then I'll come back to fill in the, the details um, of, of last week, uh, Revelation 13, connecting with Daniel 7. Okay, so, I mean, in terms of uh, last week, um, so we we briefly linked um, the beast as given in, Rev in Revelation 13 with that of Daniel 7 in terms of the animals mm -hmm. and, and what they represented. Um, so, I mean, we were able, basically, we were trying, last week's lesson, we were just aiming to establish what was God's seal. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we established that as the fourth commandment, um, the Sabbath commandment. And then we were, uh, then we looked at Satan's mark, which we established uh, as Sunday, which was uh, the change of the Sabbath to Sunday as a day of worship and the claim made by the papacy that it was the mark of their power. So we were able to use a number of, um, we were able to use a number, number of references written by um, popes and, and various leaders of the Catholic Church pointing mm -hmm. that. So we actually went through that, link it with uh, Daniel 7, um, to bring out the fact that Sunday, um, in, in fact, is when it's enforced by law, will become the mark of the beast because it was a tradition that was brought in the church when it changed the day of worship, which it claimed as its mark of its power in changing the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. Amen. You've expressed that so um, so well. I feel like a quarter of my, my lesson has already been covered very well. <laughs> so, so yes. Um, so yes, just for uh, anyone who's, who's new here and also for um, my recording, um, Revelation 13, uh, this first beast, it comes out from the sea. And um, firstly, I just want to say, um, there's a, a proper way of understanding these prophecies in the context of history. And um, the name of that principle is called historicism, um, which is to understand how these prophecies fulfill in history. Um, and the reason why this is true is because uh, that is the, what the opening verses of Revelation teach us uh, in the first few verses. In Revelation 1 verses 1 to 3, it says that John saw the things which would shortly come to pass. And uh, Jesus told us in John 14, 29, that uh, he's, he tells us the things before they come to pass, so that when they come to pass, we may believe. And so, uh, as when we see prophecy fulfilled in history, it increases our faith that we may believe in the message that the Bible has to, to, to teach us about Jesus and our Saviour. Um, so within the scope of Daniel and Revelation, uh, there is this running theme through the, those prophecies on the world kingdoms of Bible prophecy, I call them. And it begins in Daniel 2 with the King Nebuchadnezzar having this dream um, of the nations uh, that would, his, his kingdom and the successive kingdoms. And Daniel interprets his dream, uh, this statue made of four different metals, as um, the head of gold, 
representing Babylon. And then it says another kingdom after you, and then another kingdom after that, and another kingdom after that, and then um, uh, feet mixed with um, iron and clay, and, and the stone um, breaking the statue and it becoming dust. Then in Daniel 7, the same, the same, um, the same truth is repeated in different language in a different in a diff in a di yeah exactly different different symbols um so this is where daniel 7 comes in and the prophecy is again repeated in daniel 8 and also in daniel 11 but basically the kingdoms are babylon medo persia greece and rome and as uh, has already already been looked at in daniel 7 after the uh, i mean in last week's lesson um after the collapse of pagan Rome, there was this little horn which arose to think to change times and laws. And I know that last week's study covered that in detail. Um, and um, I'll, I will mention it again for, for today as well, for some to connect it with Revelation 13 as well. Because there's many parallels between the little horn and Revelation 13. And um, I think that um, to, as a nice way of starting the study uh, would be to point out those similarities. So um, if we can also go to Daniel 7, um, then we'll have our, our reference in Daniel as well. So this is starting from verse two. So Daniel ha Daniel has this um, he has this vision of the kingdoms which are to come, and uh, in verse two he basically says he w he saw um, the four winds stirring up the great sea, and then in verse three four great beasts came up from the sea. Now in Revelation thirteen we have the beast coming up from the sea. So it's the same scenario here, the beast coming up from the sea. And I know that in last week's lesson, um, it was identified from Revelation 17, 15, that waters in prophecy represents peoples. Um, so the, the and, 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 exactly. And in Daniel 7, 17, um, the angel Gabriel actually like interprets the different parts of Daniel's um, uh, vision to him, and in the interpret in the verses which go through the interpretation of the vision, in verse seventeen it says those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. So a beast in prophecy represents a king, or a kingdom. And uh, later in verse 18, it, it talks about the fourth beast representing the fourth kingdom. And verses 23 uh, and 24 also describe the fourth kingdom. So the fourth, four beasts are four kings or four kingdoms. And so uh, these beasts coming up from the sea represent these nations arising from populated areas. There's another proof text from uh, in, which is a very good comparison to Revelation 17:15, 15, um, which is actually, in my view, a better proof text than the one in Revelation. And this comes from Isaiah 17. Um, so before we go on, could we just go to Isaiah 17? Uh, and I believe it's verses um, 13 and 14. Can you memory. ask Malika to, to read that for us? Isaiah 17. What verse? Was it 13 and 14, I thought? Uh, let me just quickly uh, check that. Um, yes, 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Isaiah, yeah, yeah, 17, 12 and 13. Cool. 
and it and I'm reading from the New International Version. It reads, "Woe to the many nations that rage! They rage like the raging sea. Woe to the peoples who roar! They roar like the roaring of great waters. Although the peoples roar like the roar of surging waters, when he rebukes them, they flee far away, driven before the wind like chaff on the hills." like tumbleweed before a gale amen thank you very much for reading malika so um in this passage here uh we have this uh like clear uh identification that uh peoples are likened to seas and nations are likened to waters the nations will rush like the rushing of many waters um and then it says, but God will rebuke them and uh, they will be chased like the chaff of the, the mountains before the winds. And that is a, a that compares directly with Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 2, because in Daniel 2, uh, what Nebuchadnezzar dreams in his vision is that uh, the these are uh, the statue which represents these kingdoms um, would be um, crushed. The, the the stone smites the image on its feet and it crumbles to dust or like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and it uses the same word here in Isaiah 17 chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind so it's uh, Isaiah 17 13 connects directly with Daniel 2 35 okay let me write that down myself just yeah Okay. Yeah, Isaiah seventeen thirteen with Daniel two thirty five. Yeah. Chaff chaff by the way is like the papery outside outside of, of wheat and the the Bible has this theme of uh, like um the wheat and the chaff, separating the wheat from the chaff. And in one sense, it represents the separation of truth and error, but it can also represent the final, like, judgment scene where God is, uh, like, um, he's gathering the his his people, which are the wheat, and he is um, destroying the chaff, uh, which is are, are those who are not counted with God's people. Mm. So uh, when we go back to uh, Daniel 7, uh, Daniel sees these four beasts coming up from the sea. And in Revelation 13, the beast comes up from the sea. In Daniel 7, we've seen that the beasts represent kingdoms uh, from verse 17. And so in Revelation 13, we have the same setup, a beast rising up out of the sea. And then as Daniel uh, continues in Daniel 7, he says uh, in, from verse 3 that the first beast was like a lion. And then the, in verse 5, the second beast was like a bear. And then in verse 6, the third beast is like a leopard. So we have these three animals here, uh, which are mentioned by name, the lion, the bear and the leopard. And in Revelation 13, when we read it, it says that beast which came up from the sea had the body of a leopard. And the mouth of sorry, and and the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. And so uh, we have um, it's just straight away in in the first first few verses we have this these similarities with Daniel seven. And um, when Daniel seven is um, properly um, studied within the context of history, uh, one can see that the lion with eagle's wings represents the kingdom of Babylon. The bear represents the kingdom of Medo-Persia and the leopard with four heads and four wings represents the kingdom of Greece. And the four heads actually, um, I know this is more in Daniel 7 than in Revelation 13, but the four heads uh, represented the four divisions of the kingdom of Greece after the death of Alexander the Great. And basically, he had a number of generals, it was like 
20 generals or so which were fighting among themselves for the territory and then finally it got down to these four which were Lysimachus who took the northern part of the Greek kingdom, Cassandra who took the western part, Ptolemy who took the southern part which was Egypt and Seleucus who took the like the eastern territory of Greece. So we have it all there. We have uh, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and, you know, the four divisions of Greece, it's all there in Daniel 7. And then uh, in verse 7, he, it, it talks about this fourth beast with iron teeth. And that, of course, directly parallels Daniel 2, the fourth metal, which is iron. And this beast represents pagan Rome. And um, when we compare... Uh, the scenario in Revelation, we can see that pagan Rome is again represented there. I first would like to say that um, the beast with seven heads and ten horns is mentioned uh, three times in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's mentioned in Revelation 12, verse 3, Revelation 13, verse 1, and Revelation 17, verse 3. And um, I contend that these three references are to the same beast in different, like looking at it at, at different stages in history or in time. So um, in Revelation 12 we've got another reference to the beast with seven heads and ten horns, um, but here it's referred to as the dragon. So, could I ask someone to read for us Revelation 12, verse 3, please? Uh, maybe Elizabeth could read that for us, Elizabeth, please? Yes, so Revelation 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. Amen. Thank you for reading, Elizabeth. So this beast, uh, sorry, this um, red dragon in Revelation 12, it has seven heads and ten horns. And uh, when um, we continue reading in Revelation 12, it talks about his tail drawing a third part of the stars. And um, this is normally explained as uh, the fall of Satan in heaven. He, he deceived uh, the angels um, and so on. But I think that this prophecy really has a dual application because stars uh, can also um, represent God's messengers. Um, like it says in Revelation 1 that the angels Jesus had in his hand, the seven stars, um, and this says the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches and an angel bears a message to, to the church, so it's a message or a messenger. So a star can be an angel, and an angel is a message or a messenger. So a star can be a messenger. So and a God, God's people in that way can be stars. And it even says in Daniel 12 verse 3, that they who turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. So stars can be a symbol for God's people. And the dragon being this persecuting power over the woman which is about to give birth to this child in Revelation 12 represents, uh, well, in, in history, it's fulfilled was fulfilled as pagan Rome. Because uh, that's, what, that's what happened. Like Herod, in Matthew 2, Herod tried to kill all of the little baby boys, two years old and under, to destroy, um, to, to, kill, to kill off the Messiah. But um, uh, in Revelation 12, it doesn't put it quite like that. It doesn't say, oh, Herod um, had this um, desire to kill the children. Um, it, it really identifies what was really going on in that scene, and it says that Satan, which is the, who was the dragon, was directly trying to kill Jesus. 
and Matthew 2 just kind of explains like exactly sort of what happens. So in Revelation 12 verse 9, it identifies the dragon as Satan. It says that great dragon called the serpent, uh, sorry, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So I have these four terms here, uh, the dragon, the serpent, the, the devil, and Satan. Um, they're, all, they're all sort of the same symbol. So the, the dragon, um, refer, referred to in verse 4, is primarily referring to Satan. But uh, the dragon not only represents Satan, but it also represents the power by which Satan works. Because Satan always has a human instrument through which he works, uh, just as God has his people through which he works. And a good example of this, I believe it's in Ezekiel 29, verse 3. Ezekiel 29, and verse 3. 3. Ezekiel 29, and verse 3. Yes. Speak to him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, you great monster lying among your st streams. You say, the Nile belongs to me, I made it for myself. Thank you. So, the, um, I know there in, in your translation it says monster. Uh -huh. other, tr other translations have dragon there. Oh, so, I see. Oh, so, okay. so, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is this dragon lying in the rivers. And so while the, the, the great dragon is Satan, the like puppet dragon, as it were, is that instrument used by the great dragon. So Pharaoh here is this dragon in the midst of the rivers. But Revelation kind of explains to us that the real dragon is Satan. But Satan is, Satan is using a human instrument. And that's the kind of the point I want to make. So when we uh, um, explore the, the historical fulfillment of Revelation 12, pagan Rome was this power that, that Satan was using. Because it says in verse, as it, in verse 4, um, that the, in Revelation 12 verse 4, the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to, ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And from verse 5, it talks about the child um, being caught up to God and his throne and ruling all nations with a rod of iron. This child is Jesus. Um, it's Jesus who was caught up to God and his throne. And in Revelation 19... Uh, I believe it's 1915, it describes how Jesus would rule, will rule all nations with a rod of iron. I'll just find, the rod, I'll just find it so I can read it. Um, yes, so it's Revelation 1915. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. This is talking about Jesus. In verse 13 it says his name is called the Word of God and in verse 16 it says his name is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is a prophecy talking about Jesus. And then in verse 15 there it says he shall rule them with the rod of iron. So the child in Revelation 12 verse 5 who would rule all nations with a rod of iron is Jesus. And then from going back a verse in verse 4, it says that dragon who was ready to devour that child, if the dragon is Satan and the power by which Satan, that Satan uses, what the prophecy is saying is, is that Satan and the power which was used by Satan would be devouring, uh, would be desiring to kill this child as soon as it was born. And uh, m the Gospel of Matthew reveals that that was pagan Rome. And so when we study Revelation 13 and we have these references to, to, to the dragon, um, 
it's not only it's in verse um, two, Revelation thirteen two. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And later again in verse eleven, it said that the second beast speaks as a dragon. We must bear in mind that it's not only Satan; it is Satan, but it's uh, uh, it's also the power that Satan uses the st- um, to persecute. And the power he used was the kingdom of Rome. That's right. In Revelation twelve, the dragon was pagan Rome. That's right. So now let's let's come back to Revelation thirteen. I know we're kind of jumping around a bit, but there's like there's just lots of like references which all kind of tie together. Um, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Beast comes out of the sea, sea is people, a beast is a nation, a beast is a kingdom. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, a leopard was a Greece in Daniel 7, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, a bear was Medo-Persia in Daniel 7, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the lion was Babylon in Daniel 7. And then it says, And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, because the Bible is so poetic, and also um, by nature that the prophecies are always basically teaching the same thing, you read Revelation and it's like you're reading Daniel. They, they have the same content. Um, it's natural that this dragon represents pagan Rome. Because in Daniel 7, we have this sequence. The lion is Babylon, the bear is Medo-Persia, Greece is the leopard, and then the iron beast is pagan Rome. So in Revelation 13, we've got the reference to um, Greece, the leopard. We've got the reference to the bear, uh, Medo-Persia. And we've got the reference to the, to the lion, which is Babylon. And then we've got the dragon. So uh, when you match up the two different prophecies, uh, you can say the dragon would be the iron beast, pagan Rome. And again, like linking it with Revelation 12, the dragon is pagan Rome. So it says in verse 2 that the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So this beast which comes out from the sea, it, it gets these three things from this dragon power and the historical fulfillment of this is how pagan Rome, the dragon, gave a particular beast, a particular power, a particular little horn, I dare say, his power, his throne, and great authority. This beast in Revelation 13 represents the papacy, and the papacy obtained its power, its throne, and great authority from pagan Rome. So the power. Rome, um, I feel like I'm becoming too detailed in my explanations, but in Daniel 7, the fourth beast, which is Rome, it had ten horns, and although those horns are nations in their own rights, they're still under sort of the umbrella of Rome, in a way. And one of those horns was the Franks, which became France. One of those horns in Daniel 7 was, were the Franks. And uh, so even though they're, they're the Franks, you can still classify them prophetically as pagan Rome. And what happened was that the King Clovis I, who was the first king of the Franks in 496 AD, signed up to the Pope. Um, he became actually the first convert, because all these nations were pagan at one time. Yeah, they were um, barbarians, weren't they? Well, you call them barbarians, but... Some people find that term offensive, so oh, maybe we need to maybe we, as we, when we teach our prophecies, we need to change our terminology. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, these 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 tribal nations, um, um, 
that um, basically split off from the uh, royal lineage of Rome. One of them were the Franks, and uh, in, yeah, in, slowly, one by one, they all converted to Catholicism. This is like taught in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, and to probably go through it like would just take a, a really long time. Um, so I just want to like briefly reference it for Revelation 13. So the Franks were the first ones to convert to the papacy. Um, and the Franks gave, in, in 496, King Clovis I gave his state army to the Pope. And then the Pope had access to this state power to do whatever the papacy wanted. Which would end up, like, uh, just a few years after this, uh, from 538, like, burning people at the stake if they didn't agree with your doctrines. Um, that was the kind of power, state power, that the papacy came to have. And the papacy had this state power because the dragon, which is Satan, uh, which is pagan Rome, which is the Franks, which is under the umbrella of pagan Rome, gave this state power to the papacy, this beast which came up from the sea like a leopard. Um, it not only gave the, uh, the dragon, that's pagan Rome, not only gave the papacy its power, but also gave the papacy its throne. I want you to notice, notice that the prophecy says his power and his throne, it was the power belonging to pagan Rome that the papacy took over. And it's interesting that the Bible kind of portrays it like this, because later in Revelation 13, we have this second beast giving authority to the first beast. So you have like almost like a repeat of history. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. The, the throne was fulfilled by Constantine in the year 330 because Constantine um, was ruling from the city of Rome. And in the year 330 AD, he relocated the capital to Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. Exactly, it's, today it's Istanbul, but previously it was Constantinople. And that was, um, by relocating the capital, the original capital in the city of Rome, in a way, was left vacant. And so, basically, the papacy sort of moved in, and it um, created Vatican City, and the ancient temple of the pagan gods, the, the Pantheon, became the, like, the celebration of the Twelve Apostles. Everything which was pagan became, had a, a Christian interpretation put on it, and so Rome, which was like the seat of paganism, instead became the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. And so that is the throne in 330 AD. And great authority, the last one, it refers to the spiritual authority that was basically conferred on the Catholic Church by Rome. And the history of this is, I believe it's in five, it was in 533 AD, that the Roman Emperor Justinian uh, made the Pope the corrector of heretics. He said, you know, I'm basically acknowledging that your, like, holy power is supreme and you have the authority to bind the souls of men um, in, on, on, in heaven on hell and on earth or something like that because that's a doctrine the papacy had that you know what, what the pope says affects your eternal salvation and there's no salvation outside of the church and um basically the history is that um the one of the roman emperors from byzantine rome that's the eastern roman empire um the emperor justinian in 533 he acknowledged uh, in, in a letter to um, one, the Pope at the time, he acknowledged that uh, the papacy does indeed have this, like, supernatural authority over the souls of men. 
And so that is this, this reference here to the great authority, like this, it's a, like a spiritual authority. But notice that the prophecy doesn't say his great authority. It just says great authority. The dragon gave him his power, that was the state power actually owned by pagan Rome, the Franks, um, Clovis' army. His throne, you know, Rome was actually, I mean, okay, uh, Rome was um, uh, ruling from the city of Rome, so it was his throne, but the great authority wasn't actually his authority. It was just something which was acknowledged by Justinian, and it's amazing how the Bible um, portrays this like so accurately as it was fulfilled historically in history. And then it says in verse 3 um, about one of his heads being wounded to death. Um, could I ask someone to read verses th 3 and 4? Uh, for us, please. Um, Elizabeth, could you read that for us? Uh, yes, three and four of, sorry. Revelation 13. Okay. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast who's able to make war with him thank you very much for reading that so um one of his heads was wounded to death and i'm trying not to get into it too much because i won't even get to the mark of the beast bit of it but uh the papacy received this deadly wound um in the year 1798. Basically, uh, France had this massive rebellion. And the, the French Revolution, they rebelled against all forms of religion. They like, totally rejected God um, completely. And also, as um, uh, an effect of that, the Pope was captured, the Vatican was surrounded, and um, all the nations basically lost their respect for the papacy. Before that, the Pope could would say, you know, such and such individual is a heretic, burn him at the stake. And um, that's the kind of thing that would happen. Um, but when uh, General Berthier under Napoleon surrounded the Vatican and uh, made war with Vatican City, captured the Pope, took him into exile, basically uh, the Catholic Church lost that power, they lost that state power, um, because previously they had this um, ability to use the power of the state to enforce whatever they wanted. And now they didn't have that power, they had this deadly wound. So the wound, basically what the wound is, is that uh, inability to uh, inability to use the power of the state to uh, to persecute. And then there's a prophecy about the healing of the wound, which tells us that at some future point, the wound will be healed. And I know that sometimes when some uh, uh, men explain this prophecy. Um, I point to the year 1929 that the Vatican, like, um, had a little uh, corner of the the state again. That's something else that happened in 1798. They lost their territory completely, but since 1929 they were granted like a little piece of land again to have, you know, Vatican City. Um, and this. This is maybe like steps towards the healing of the wound, but it's not really the healing of the wound at all, because what the wound did is that it meant that it no longer had authority over the state to control the conscience of consciences of men. But the prophecy teaches that one day it will again have this state power to enforce their doctrines and decrees, and whoever doesn't want to follow with their doctrines 
will be beheaded. Actually, let's read that, um, so kind of jumping ahead. But, I mean, you know, Revelation 13 jumps ahead to two. Revelation 20, verse 4. Can somebody volunteer to read that for us, please? Revelation 20, verse 4. He said, yes. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or, or, or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Amen. Thank you so much. I know, by the way, that the millennium was one of the previous lessons in this series. Um, now, here in this verse, we have all of these references uh, that Revelation 13 describes. We've got the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, um, and the mark in the forehead or in the right hand. All of that is from Revelation 13. And it says that there are going to be these souls, which are people, uh, who would be beheaded because of not receiving the mark of the beast which tells us that when the mark of the beast is enforced that people are going to die for their faith just as anciently people died uh, for their faith during the dark ages people were burned at the stake um, for disagreeing with what the catholic church had to say um, so it says uh, but in verse 4, I'm back in, in Revelation 13 now. In Revelation 13, it says they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so the Bible asks this like rhetorical question, who is able to make war with the beast? As in, it's going to be so powerful, so global, that it's going to have this full control over all the state power who is able to make war with him make war is used something that's done by the state who is able to make war with him the answer is no one because the wound has been healed and who has all control of the state power it's the papacy so if there's this global system which has full control over all the state power then no one will be able to make war against it because it has all the power that there is to have. Yeah. So then when we come to verse five, it again talks about the character of the beast who comes up out beast which comes up out of the sea, which is the paper sea. Could I ask someone to read for us uh, verses five until eight? Revelation thirteen. Revelation thirteen, five to eight. Yes, please. And it reads, The beast was given a mouth to utter pound, proud words and blasphemy, blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blasphemy God um, and to slander his name and his dwelling, dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Um, was it seven as well? Seven yes. and, eight. and eight. Okay. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, and all, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Lamb who, has, who was slain from the creation of the world. Thank you very much for reading. Uh, Malika. So there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and that seems to be a consistent feature of this prophecy or of the, the power of the papacy. In Daniel 7 it says the little horn spoke great pomp and pompous words. It spoke great things against the Most High. It made war with God's saints. Here in Revelation 13 it also speaks blasphemy. So we not only have these similar characteristics in the opening verses with Daniel 7, but we also have the characteristic of blasphemy, and we'll see in a minute, uh, this ruling for the same time period. So, um, 
um, the paper C. Similar to the uh, beasts referenced in Daniel 7, comes up as the C, same as Daniel 7, and speaks blasphemies just as the little horn does in Daniel 7, and rules for the exact same time period as the little horn rules in Daniel 7. All of this is essentially just proof that the beast, the first beast in Revelation 13 that comes up from the sea is the papacy. And it's the papacy that had the power, throne and great authority given to it by pagan Rome. It's the papacy in verse 5 that had this blasphemous mouth to speak blasphemy against God. And then it says authority was given to continue 42 months. Now, this time period, which is the 1260 years, is actually mentioned um, seven times throughout the Bible. And in Daniel and in Revelation, it's twice in Daniel and five times in the book of Revelation. And it's, it's under different, uh, uh, uses, it uses, the Bible uses different language to describe the same time period. In Daniel, it says a time, times, and half a time. That's in Dan from Daniel 7, 25. It's also in Daniel 12, verse 7, a time, times, and half a time. In Revelation 11, verse 2, it describes it as um, uh, a, it's either 42 months and then 1260 days in the next verse, or it's the other way around, 1260 days followed by 42 months. And then in Revelation 12, verse 6, it says 1260 days. And then in, in Revelation 12, 14, it's times, times and half a time. And then this one is the last reference here, 13, Revelation 13, 5, 42 months. These seven references represent the same time period of 1260 years. Um, shall we go, can I, um, I think it would be appropriate to go, th to go through that um, for 42 months bit. So, um, what does a day represent in prophecy? Um, so a day uh, represents a year. That's right. And how do you know that a day represents a year? Uh, it's in is it is it Ezekiel four and verse six. That is correct. Would you like to find this and read it for us, please? Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel 4 and verse 6. Yeah, it says here, After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Thank you very much. Now, so is that saying that whenever God makes a prophecy, um, it, so when he uses when he uses the forty days, um, a year a day for each year, that, that was a pro prophecy that God was making. This was a, this was a specific specific prophecy in Ezekiel, and um, I've got something else to say on the actual prophecy itself, but let me just like not mention it because it would be too. It would be. It would. It would no longer be on the mark of a beast. I think. I think how yeah. we can can summarize it. Yes. Whenever um, uh, God uses, pro, pro, so whenever He uses this type of language, it's usually within a prophetic setting. Exactly. So, so basically, Ezekiel had this. He had to lie on his side for three hundred and ninety-one, uh, three hundred and ninety days, um, and um, it was. And then there was another bit of it, which was forty days, and it was representing this siege which would come against Jerusalem. All of this is in Ezekiel four, and then in verse six it says, you know, the fact that you'll lie on your side this number of days represents that Jerusalem will be besieged this same number of years. And so in prophetically, it's saying that in prophecy, a day is symbolic, is in, exactly symbolic of a year. But not at other times, just in 
prophetic language. Exactly. Um, in, in Numbers 14, there's a comparison, and it's interesting, it's also 40 days uh, in Numbers. This is from Numbers 14, verse 34. And it says, According to the number of the, the, of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. So, again it says, each day for a year. I know that the King James Version at least has this, uh, put, uh, phrases this in that way, each day, each day for a year. And the story in, in Numbers is that God was giving them the promised land and said, spy out the land for 40 days. That's from, I think it's chapter Numbers 13, 25. It mentions, it says, they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So these, these 12 sets of men they went in, spied out the land for 40 days. They came back. All this is, all this is in Numbers 14. And the people, like, basically rejected what they had to say. Um, ten of them said, oh, the land is a terrible land. It eats up the inhabitants thereof. You know, uh, let's just appoint a captain and go back to Egypt. It, it, it had a really, like, uh, uh, doubting, halting uh, spirit in them. And Joshua and Caleb said, no, let's go up and take the, take the land. And in the end, uh, the people sided with the ten and wanted to go back to Egypt. And God was very, very angry with Israel and said, OK, you know what? Uh you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and die in the wilderness and you are not going to go into that land but your children will go in and so um in this whole like god's god's reproof to them he says in verse 34 you spied up the land for 40 days so you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years each day for a year so again there's like this prophetic um connotation that in prophecy a day represents a year um secondly um in prophecy a there are there are 30 days in a month now i know uh, many of us might take that for granted um but just to give a reference to um prove that co in a concrete way when the um flood is accounted in um genesis chapters 7 and 8 um it describes the waters upon the earth for um, 150 days. It's mentioned that twice in Genesis 7 and in the beginning of Genesis 8. The waters were upon the earth for 150 days. And it also says that the flood began on the 17th day of the second month and ended on the 17th day of the seventh month, which is exactly five months. So exactly five months is equated with 150 days. And so there, therefore, 150 days divided by five months gives you 30 days in one month. So now we've got this prophecy in Revelation 13, where it says this beast had this power to make war with God's people for 42 months. So um, these 42 months, uh, 42 months multiplied by 30 days in a month, if you do the maths, it's 1,260 days. And because in prophecy a day is symbolic of a year, it is 1,260 years that this uh, beast in Revelation 13 makes war with God's people, and this is this is the same as the three and a half times in Daniel 7:25, and it's the same as the the other references in Daniel and Revelation to this period, and that the 1260 years was fulfilled from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. In 538, um, the Pope, well, basically the the last of, uh, in Daniel 7, it says it would uproot three horns. Um, the, the, the little horn would uproot three horns. So the papacy would come to its full power after it had like destroyed the last of its opposing powers. So the Ostrogoths 
um, lost battle to the papacy in 538 AD. So then the papacy had full control over uh, and be able to have a full full authority to do whatever it wants, wanted to do. So it starts in 538. And then again, uh, as I described earlier, the French Revolution in 1798, when it got, to, got its deadly wounds, marks the ending of its of its like, reign of power in that sense. So between the year 538 AD and 1798 AD, there's an exact 1,260 days, uh, years, which are day, prophetic days, which is the same as the 42 months in verse 5. Does anyone have, um, I feel like I've been talking for a long time, does anyone have any questions just on that bit of it before I go on? Any questions, anyone? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll take that as a no. So the papacy ruled for 1260 years from 538 to 1798, and this is how that bit of history fulfills. Um, then in verse 10, it says, um, he, I'm in Revelation 13, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. You know, the papacy was uh, leading people into captivity, like spiritually, they were destroying people's faith in, in a way. They were locking people up in prison um, for believing heresy. And, and the Bible says, you know, eye for an eye, tooth, tooth for tooth, foot for foot, hand for hand, scar for scar. If you afflict someone, you yourself will be afflicted in the same way. The papacy put people in prison, um, so the papacy itself would be in prison in a way, and the Pope, the leader of the church, was actually locked away in a castle in the south of France and died the following year in 1799. And so in that sense, it was in captivity. It was not able to wield its power that it once had. And then it says, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Um, now, the sword represents the power of the state. And there's a good proof text for this in Romans chapter 13. Um, could I ask somebody to read for us Romans 13, verse 4, please. Um, who's going to read that for us? Um, Werner, would you be able to read that for us? Actually, on second thoughts, could it be Romans 13, verses 1 to 4? Romans 13, verse 1 to 4? Yes, please. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be her ordained, ordained by God, whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, they that resist it shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Amen. Thank you so much for reading that. And this text in Romans 13 is actually really important for the second bit of Revelation 13, which we'll see a bit later. Um, um, I could, that was the King James Version you were reading from, which was a lovely translation. And um, by the way, that word power there uh, really means authority. So let every soul to be subject to the higher powers. Uh, it means the governing authorities. Um, and so basically what the, the passage teaches, uh, the whole chapter of Romans 13, but especially these initial verses, is it says uh, Christians should be subject to the government. They should be obedient to what the government has to say because it says God is the one who gives them that authority. Uh, God is the one that has placed them in that position. And it says in verse four that uh, the government is God's minister to us for good. 
but if we do evil, be afraid, because he does not bear the sword in vain. And so here in verse 4, it, it uh, symbolises the state power with a sword. So the sword represents the power of the state in prophecy. That's from Reve uh, Romans 13, verse 4. So in Revelation 13, uh, where it says, um, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That's in verse 10. What it's saying is, he who kills by using the power of the state, which is exactly what the papacy did for 1260 years, themselves would be killed by the power of the state. And that's what happened with the French Revolution. Um, General Berthier and Napoleon, they rallied around the Vatican, and it was on the it was three dates. Uh, but basically, it's the 10th of February, 1798, the papacy was defeated. Um, and then, yeah, it says, here's the patience and faith of the saints, because, you know, those who were enduring the whole 1260 years had to have that patience and that faith to endure. Um, now we come to the second beast um, in verse, from verse 11. And the second beast um, has um, a lot of qualities to it which causes it to give authority to the first beast. Could I ask us, uh, someone please to read verses 11 to... Um, actually, verse... Yeah, 11 to 15. Revelation 13, 11 to 15. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet live. The Go for the fifth, verse 15 as well. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. The NIV has such a lovely translation there. So, um, there's, there's lots in this, so let's just go through it. Um, verse 11, it's another beast. And once again, from uh, the reference in Daniel 7, in prophecy, a beast represents a nation. So, it's another nation coming up out of the earth. And by the way, the original language, the original word here for coming up is like um, is like used for like a, a plant just like springing up out of the earth. So it's like the, just the very early beginnings of this nation. So it's a nation having early beginnings. And this is right after or right around the time of the papacy's deadly wounds. So we're looking for a nation just uh, uh, coming into power at the same time as the, it's around 1798. That's what we're looking for in history, for this application to be fulfilled. And it says that this nation was just coming into power around the time of 1798, approximately. It had two horns like a lamb. And the lamb, in prophecy, represents Jesus. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But yet it speaks like a dragon. And the dragon, as I said at the start of the study, represents Satan primarily and pagan Rome secondarily. So it's going to be a bit similar to pagan Rome, in a way, this second beast. And um, this nation is the United States of America. Yes, I knew there was something else, the earth. Yeah, so the first beast came up out of the sea. And as we read before, the sea represents, you know, nations, like a sea of people, a densely populated area. 
the earth is the opposite where you don't have few people and um there's like this a general a general application and a, a like a specific fulfillment the the general um definition given by the bible is that sea represents many people so earth would represent few people by contrast but when you study the like the the actual like historical fulfillment the sea essentially you can call it europe because the sea was the origin or well, babylon like originated around iraq you know that was the lion coming up out of the sea medo persia is like around that kind of near middle eastern area um and then greece greece had the territory of like sort of southern europe kind of approximately and then um uh, rome like rome extended from like britain all the way to africa it had this huge territory pagan rome did so before beasts that came up from the sea when you apply it like historically the sea is like sort of the area of europe um so the earth is like the opposite side of the world so when you put all of these characteristics together there's really only one nation that fits the specification for this prophecy coming up on the opposite side of the world to europe around 1798 two horns like a lamb which is a reference to you know the fact that it's a christian nation it is the united states of america they had their declaration of independence in 1776 which is around the same time as 1798 yeah, and the two horns um, uh, are also significant. So yes, to be able to identify the nation, so one horn represents um, a republican government that is a government without a a king, and it also um, has a church without a pope. Amen. So the the two horns stood for republicanism and Protestantism. That's a perfect explanation. Thank you so much for, for um, contributing that, Joy. And it's the only nation in the earth like that. That's right. That's, that's right, actually. America is unique. It, there's no other nation that has that form of government and that form of church. Um, so America is really, really special in that way. Um, and yeah, historically, people were fleeing from Europe, trying to escape what the papacy was trying to do to the two to people and so they signed the u.s constitution saying congress shall make no law establishing uh religion uh i can't remember the exact wording establishing um or uh, religion or like causing people to worship a certain way basically or prohibiting the free exercise thereof so they had this total freedom in a way total democracy and religious freedom religious liberty but it spoke like a dragon so it's it's such a contradiction it says it's like a lamb but it will speak as a dragon and um to speak a nation speaks by led by its led, led legislation it will legislate like a dragon um basically and the dragon as I said, represents Satan, and it also represents pagan Rome, and the kind of kind of laws that pagan Rome came up with against the Christians in the first century, the Bible teaches is the kind of thing that America is going to do against God's people in the last days. So let's continue, um, going on, verse 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So that this second beast, which is the USA, exercises the authority of the papacy. Now this is interesting because the, originally the authority that the papacy had was given to him by the dragon in verse 4. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So the authority was, if you, like, pagan Rome had this authority. It wasn't actually his authority, but it was given anyway to the papacy. And then the second beast exercises the same authority that the papacy exercised. And what the papacy exercised was this like spiritual authority over the souls of people in that way. Not, not that they actually had that authority, but that's what they claimed to have. And that's what they were acknowledged to have by 
kings and you know governors and etc etc but it didn't actually have it but you know that's what they claimed and here in verse 12 it says that the he will the second beast will exercise that same authority of the first beast in his very presence and it will cause the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first beast now i want us to notice this word here worship in revelation 14 uh, where it talks about the three angels messages we also have this contrast in worship in revelation 14 verse 7 we have the first angel's message calling people to true worship it says worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water that is um the first angel's message um, this angel proclaims the gospel to the whole world that's the last part of verse 7 worship him who made heaven earth the sea and the springs of water and this is a direct reference to the sabbath the creator the creator made heaven earth the sea and all that in them is and it's actually um i don't think we've got like time to read it but if you read exodus 20 verse 11 which is the end of the fourth commandment it reads identically with revelation 14 verse 7 it's a direct reference to the sabbath um that's the true worship in revelation 14 verse 7 and then just two verses later there's a warning against this false worship. It says, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself should also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, poured out without mercy into the cup of his indignation. This is how, that's how verse 9 reads in Revelation 14. So we have this, the, tr the contrast here between the true worship and this counterfeit worship. And going back to Revelation 13, verse 12, it talks about how the second beast will cause the whole world to worship the first beast. It's the worship of the beast, which is this theme in the prophecy, both in Revelation 13, verse 12, and Revelation 14, verse 9. It's the worship of the beast. Um, whose wound was healed and again what the wound was what the wound did is it took away the state power of the papacy so the healing of the wound is the return of that state power so apparently america will use its power it use its state power in a way which will be like how the papacy used it previously and this is this is what we're just about to learn from verse 15 and this is also tying into romans 4 we read earlier um let me just um yeah i'll just skip verse 13 for now it says verse 14 he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived is the papacy who was wounded by the sword in 1798 and at some point in the future it will live again and it's saying the that papacy there is the roman catholic church to be specific sometimes when we use the term papacy people aren't quite sure what that means but it specifically means a roman catholic church doesn't it uh yes well i think it's 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 the, it's the church plus the state power plus the state power that the church exercised so it's not just the church but it's the church plus that you know specific authority that that they had at that time but, yes because yeah. it, it, it exercised but it was both a religious and political power exactly it had its political that political aspect um so yes that's correct joy thank you for sharing yes the, the papacy is the roman catholic church for anyone who wasn't sure um uh it was that power that had the deadly wound in 1798 and at some point in the future it will live again and so revelation 13 verse 14 it says america 
deceives those who dwell on the earth by those miracles which he had the ability to do. Um, and he, he deceived them and told them that they should make an image to the first beast that was wounded by the sword. Now, by the way, let me just, I know I skipped over it, but let me go back to it. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So that's America who will cause fire to come down from earth? It says, it says he, and he is the second beast. It's the, an, another beast coming up out of the earth. So that's the United States who will cause fire to come down from earth? Yes, yes, yes. And obviously there will be, you know, it will be fulfilled through specific individuals who will like sort of work miracles by Satan's power. But it basically, what sort of prophecy is identifying it as the the USA? Does everybody anybody has any question on that? I mean, because this is kind of like new information. Um, does does anyone have any question about that? The role of the United States and and understand that from the prophecy as Robert presented it. Or is this this kind of new and you're not quite getting your head around it? It's new and I'm trying to get my head. What did I just came on? So, mm. but um, yeah, it's food for thoughts. <laughs> it's totally different from previous teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Malika, are you still getting your head wrapped around it as well, or so? Yeah, I'm still trying to process it. I'm trying to figure out what does it mean by, is it literal when it says spewing out fire, or, I mean? Well, um, the, the reference to the fire in verse 13, I, I have this, um, I, have, I remember the story of Job in Job chapter 1, and it says that Job lost everything in one day. And one of those things it says is that fire came down from heaven and burned up the sheep. That's in Job 1 verse 16, by the way, where fire came from heaven and burned up the sheep. And when Job 1 is, is read, there's this understanding here that Satan is the one that was afflicting Job. Satan was the one that brought this fire down from heaven to burn up the sheep. So this, uh, uh, in verse 13, where it talks about the second beast causing fire to come down from heaven. It's basically miracles which are worked by Satan's power. Because Satan has the power to work miracles too. Mm. Um, and the, um, the interesting thing is, is that um, in the Old Testament, whenever God would accept an animal sacrifice, um, because animals were sacrificed on the altar, representing the sacrifice that Jesus would make for our sins. When God wanted to show that he accepted that sacrifice, fire would come down from heaven and burn up that sacrifice. That was a supernatural sign that God said, I accept the sacrifice. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry. So, um... You're saying no. Um, I understand from previous studies that um, America is a long life beast. Yeah. But um, why would Satan try to do something that God do when you offer sacrifice? Because this bit about um, America and the dragon blowing fire from in heaven, that bit I'm a bit puzzled over. So can you kind of the way, the way I see it is that um, uh, it is, it's almost like saying that this false worship will be accepted or is acceptable. It's a deception. Yeah. In order to understand the deception, you first have to understand the, the truth as God gave it. So what God said is, or, or how it works in the Old Testament, is that uh, we, you offer your true sacrifice representing Jesus and God would send the fire coming from heaven to show that he accepts it. So the fire was like a, an acknowledgement that this, you know, worship 
is acceptable to God. Um, so the counterfeit fire coming from heaven is like a counterfeit uh, uh, acknowledgement that this type of worship is acceptable to God. Because it says in verse 12, they will cause the earth to worship the first beast. And the fire is like this, um, like uh, symbolically, it's like the confirmation that this is the right thing to do. And it, obviously it isn't, it's a deception. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, because you see, um, Satan always mimics what God does. Exactly. And that's how he deceives, you know. Um, Amen. We just talked about la in last week that how he transferred the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. And mm -hmm. so refer when you talk about the Sabbath to people, they immediately think of Sunday. Certainly when you use the term Lord's Day, the Lord's Day, I don't know anyone who is not, say, a member of the Sabbath faith who thinks of the Lord's Day as this Saturday. There's virtually nobody mm -hmm. out of Seventh-day Adventism who understand the Lord's Day to mean Saturday. They all um, believe it means Sunday. Yeah. And when you go to them and say, but the Lord says you are to worship him on the Lord's Day, they think Sunday, but you said, no, the Bible says the Lord's Day is Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Amen. You're thinking, but no, my grandmother, my great grandmother before her, and her great grandmother before her knew that the Lord's Day is Sunday. So here now, uh, so you see, Satan has got that in their heads. So that yes. you think of when you think when you say Lord's Day, you inst instantly think Sunday. And, and until you read the Bible. You do not realize you. That's only time you will come to realize that the Lord's Day could only refer to Sabbath or the Saturday. So that's how Satan builds up his um, deception. He mimics what God does, plant it in your brain, um, so that when he does his deception, you immediately, you instinctively think it's coming from God when it's coming from Him. That's how he works. Amen. He takes the truth of God, puts a little, uh, puts a little lie in it, so that you then are become deceived. He, he never totally comes straight out with a lie. He mixes it with the lie with truth. Amen. So he gets exactly. it. So if you don't know the scripture, if you don't know the word of God, you will be deceived. Somebody was going to say something. Yeah, may I interject something? So from my understanding, um, what this is talking about is, um, of course, generally America, the United States. But more specifically, I think it refers to the fallen Protestantism. So we know that, you know, how the United States were created. It was like a haven for people that were persecuted from the Catholic Church. It was supposed to be this free country for especially Protestants. Mm. And so since then, they have come a long way. And um, so this fallen Protestantism combined with spiritualism is actually what Satan is using currently and also even more in the future in the last days to mm. perform these great signs, you know, um, like it will be actual miracles. We know that um, the prophecy like God has prophesied that um, if we are not strong in our faith, even we will be deceived by them. Like, it will be so powerful. So I think this is more specifically what this is referring to, not that the U.S. as a country will perform these miracles, but specifically um, the spiritual that, it is. Exact, exactly, yeah. So that they will, as it says in verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on earth. It's specifically to deceive, to say, no, I am actually the Christ, which is, he's the Antichrist, but it's always this, this deception. That's how I understand it. That's, uh, I, I would definitely agree with that, 100%. And um, uh, I think you've you expressed it very clearly. I'm sorry if I wasn't as, as, as clear as that, but um, that's exactly right.
And that's also how I understand it. And we can already begin to see um, some changes in America, because remember, America is supposed to be the bastion of Protestantism. This is where, as um, Elizabeth says, the persecuted people of Europe went to this um, uh, underpopulated land to find refuge from the persecution from the Catholic Church. But here, and, and when they went there, they said, right, we want a church without a pope. We just want to worship this living God, and anybody can worship according to their consciences without anyone pressuring them to worship one particular way. So anybody can, in America, you could just go set up a church anywhere, no problem, because the state would not intervene. You're free to do whatever you like. But that's gradually changing as time goes by, and this bastion of Protestantism or freedom of worship um, has now, for example, the vast, mem the vast number of uh, people who, who um, representatives who are in Congress are Roman Catholics. And the Supreme Court, which is the third, because America has three branches of government, you have the executive branch, which is the president. Then you have the legislative branch, which is the Supreme Court. And then what's the other one? Uh, the justice system, I think. The justice, the Department of Justice. Uh, so, so those are the three portions. Of, so none of them is supposed to be dominant over the other as such. They're supposed to act as to balance each other. Mm -hmm. Now... The the no, right now, right at this very moment, we for the second time in the history of America, it has a Catholic president. We don't know how that's going to play out. We just have to see how what happens about that. But the, but in a Protestant nation which was very hostile to Catholicism, now has a Catholic president. But not only that, the next arm which is the legislative arm, There is, a, which is the one that comprises the, the judges and so on, the legislatures. Not one Protestant is on there. Six of the nine judges are Catholic. So you can see how things are, are moving in this direction. And, when, and those people who um, form the judges in the Supreme Court they reign sometimes until they die, and that can be 60, 70 years. They can be in, 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 you know, reigning. So once you get that position, unless you die, you, you just reign for decades. And so already you can see how s Satan, through, uh, you know, government and people, are beginning to align things together. So you have the... The executive branch currently has a Catholic president, and the Supreme Court has six Catholic judges out of nine, and not one of them is a Protestant in a nation that is supposed to be Protestant. So you can already begin to see how this thing is, is, is moving in the direction of the prophecy. That is food for thought, and uh, I expressed it um... Uh, very, very well. Thank you so much for sharing, Joy, uh, sharing those thoughts. Um, I'd really like to get onto the subjects of the image of the beast um, before it gets too late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, because that's a very important feature of this prophecy. So uh, I'll read verses 14 and 15 again. It says, He, that's the second beast, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those miracles which he was allowed to do in the sight of the beast. That's the first beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now, um, what is an image? An image is like a, ref a reflection or, or a copy. If, if, uh, if I have a camera and I take a picture of something, I've taken an image of, you know, a particular object. So um, applying it to the prophecy, the image 
to the beast or the image of the beast is like there's going to be some kind of reflection of the original beast in this second beast here. So the model that the papacy had during the Dark Ages, the beast that came up out of the earth with seven heads and ten horns and that ruled for 42 months, its policy was to uh, control the state power. It was the church controlling the state to enforce doctrine. When the Pope said, um, you have to worship a particular way, if you said no, there would be fines, there would be punishments, there would be burning of, at the stake for heretics. And that's how the papacy undertook its business, but, um, using the state power to instill fear into people if they disobeyed um, particular doctrines that they held. So what the prophecy says here is that um, there's going to be some type of change in the church system in America. Whilst America has this principle of the separation of church and state, and that the government shall not legislate any laws to uh, give favour to a particular religion or to restrict the free exercise of religion, what the prophecy says here in Revelation 13 is that they will make an image to the beast. The beast is the papacy, it's the Roman Catholic Church, which in the Dark Ages ruled with the state power. So when the USA, when the, when the Protestant churches of the USA influence the state power of the USA to enforce particular doctrines and decrees to legislate in favour of religion. This is a copy of or an image of the papal beast. Is that a, is that a, a clear point? Yes, so it's using it's basically the same thing that the Catholic Church would use to maintain its power is basically the same thing that the United States government would use to maintain its power. Exactly, that's that's exactly right. So the 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 way that the Catholic Church um, went about its business during the Dark Ages, using the power of the state to enforce. Uh, its laws and its religious decrees. So the Protestants, Protestant churches in the USA will use the power of the state to, in, to enforce what they want to do. That's what the image of the beast is. The image of the beast is when the church uses the power of the state to enforce religion. The image of the beast is where the uh, church uses the power of the state to enforce religion. And verse 15, it says, uh, those, anyone who is not um, granted power uh, to give, um, so he was granted power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Um, speak and cause. How would a nation speak and how would a nation cause something or enforce something? A nation speaks by its legislation. If, if you're going to say like America said this or Britain said that, it's, it's enacted through legislation. And cause is to enforce that policy with, you know, whatever, the power of the state, fines and police and, you know, the army and what have you. Well, we see that happening right now here in Britain. We see that happening right... COVID. Right. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's almost like COVID is like a trial run for the real thing, because we know that the real thing will be a religious controversy over worship, and that anyone that doesn't follow through with this, you know, religious, um, you know, spiritual um, decree to observe 
Sunday in place of the Sabbath uh, will be killed, it says in verse 15. But, and like COVID is like a, a, like a test. It's like the same type, it's like the same, same system, but not quite used in that way yet. If, if, is in, not in a religious sense. Not, not in a religious sense, but it's just used in a, in a, a health sense. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, yeah, the, the health, the health message, the true health message is the entering wedge to proclaim the truth. And um, this stuff with COVID is the entering wedge for preparing the way for what is to come, as it says in Revelation 13. So very solemn times we're living in. Yeah. Um, let me just quickly get on to the Mark of the Beast. Uh, I know that you covered the Mark of the Beast actually very well last week. Um, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man would, could buy or sell except he who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, the beast is the Roman Catholic Church, and the mark of the beast is like this mark of authority of the Roman Catholic Church, which is the keeping of Sunday. It's, it's associated uh, as worship, uh, with, with with worship in Revelation 14, verse 9. It talks about uh, the worship of the beast and the image and the reception of the mark. Uh, so it's, it, it's, you know, some, some um, interpreters of this prophecy have this idea that it's a, a literal, physical thing that people receive in their right hand or forehead, like um, a microchip or an RFID card or something that the government can use to control you. And maybe those things will be there for the government to use to control you. But the mark of the beast is um, the, the counterfeit of, is like the contrast of the true Sabbath is the keeping of Sunday as the Catholic Church says in several quotations, Sunday is our mark of authority. And the fact that we've changed the Sabbath shows that we have more authority than God himself. Because the Bible says, keep the Sabbath day holy, and we're saying, no, you are to keep Sunday holy. So if you're keeping Sunday, not the Sabbath, then basically the only reason you're doing it is because we told you to do it. It's not in the Bible. You're, do you're keeping Sunday because the Catholic Church has said Sunday is the Lord's day. And by acknowledging that and practicing that, it is um, a sign of allegiance to the Catholic Church. And I know the Bible here talks about the forehead and the right hand. The forehead um, and the right hand, it's actually, it actually has a very um, close relationship with Deuteronomy 6. Um, could we just read, go to Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 yeah, to 8? I actually explained that last week, so you may, I think they should understand the forehead is a seat of intelligence, the hand represents yes. the chin. So okay. we'll okay. cover that last oh. week. Okay, thanks for that, Joy. So, um, exactly, and uh, another reference to the right hand is in Psalm 144. It connects the right hand with falsehood, or error or wrongdoing so it's it's not just um you know the right hand can be used to represent wrongdoing when it's the wicked their right hand is a right hand of wrongdoing so um it's 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 a moral issue is what i'm trying to say it's not just the reception of some modern technology in your physical right hand or forehead but it's an act of doing wrong and uh, it is an allegiance to the papacy. Yeah. And then in verse 18, it says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. That's the first beast um, that came out from the sea. It is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, um, 
the application of this number, calculating the number of this man who is the leader of the first beast that came up from the sea. It's basically the number of the Pope. The Pope is this man who is this leader of the Catholic, who is the leader of the Catholic Church. And that's the, the that's the beast. The beast is the Catholic Church. So the papacy during the Dark Ages, they had this, the Pope wore this sort of like tiara representing his authority of, it was actually a three state, a three level tiara representing his authority over heaven, earth, and hell. And the, uh, the title on that tiara said uh, Vicarius Filii Dei, which was Latin, which means Vicar of the Son of God. And in Latin, uh, numbers are represented by letters. And when you spell out Vicarius Filii Dei, it actually sums to 666 in Latin. And um, maybe doing this over Zoom is kind of more difficult, but I wrote it out. I wrote it out here, so um, can you see there on my um, bit of paper? It, and they have the calculation there in the lesson. So, so yeah, the calculation is there in the lesson. But basically, a V is a five in Latin, an I is a one, a C is a hundred. Um, every time you see a V or a U, that's a five. An I is a one. A D is a five hundred. Um, L is a 50, all these are just Roman numerals and what they mean. And when you add up the different components of the name, it sums to 666. Vicarius is 112, Filii is 53, and Day is 501, which sums to 666. Does anyone have any... Um, Actually, let me just first mention um, that one is when people explain this prophecy, that's the main one they give, Vicarius Filii Dei, because that was on the Pope's tiara. But the Catholic Church has a few other like references for the Pope in Latin, which also sum to 666. Um, there's one called Ludovicus, um, which is L V D O V I C V S. Ludovicus, and that means vicar of the court, like, you know, the Pope was like the vicar of the court, and uh, Ludovicus sums to 666. There's also another one called Dux Clary, which is D-V-X and Clary C-L-E-R-I. Dux Clary, and that means captain of the clergy, and, you know, the Pope was the captain of the clergy in a way. And Dux is 515, Clary is 151, and that sums to 666. Um, actually, I can show you my page where I've got it at the same time. Um, another one is uh, Rex Latinus Sacerdos, which means King of the Roman Priests, and that sums up in Latin as 666. And there's even another one that the Catholic Church refers to themselves as the light of God, the holy light of God, Sancta Lux Dei, Sancta Lux Dei, the holy, holy, holy light of God, which is the, the Catholic Church's reference to themselves. And that is also 666. And so it's not only um, Vicarius Filii Dei, but there's several other Latin names as well which are equally 666. Does anyone have any uh, uh, questions on on that? Anybody? Okay, no. Do we, we, no, so, no, we just need to... Just so so um, how about I sort of like um, wrap up Revelation 13 and make a couple of comments on Revelation 14, uh, which is kind of the lesson makes, um, and then um, we can close. Yeah. Okay. So um, to wrap up Revelation 13, there are these two beasts here. There's the beast which comes up from the sea, which is the papacy, 
and there's a beast which comes up from the earth, which is the USA. Uh, the Bible says that the USA, or the second beast, will uh, make an image to the first beast. Um, the church, the Protestant churches of the USA, will adopt the same um, look. Like like it will look, if you looked at them, it would be like looking at the papacy. They're using, they would use the power of, they will use the power of the state to control the conscience. Just as the papacy used the power of the state to control the conscience. And verse 18 there here is like um, a comment to understand uh, who the first beast is. It is the number of a man. That's the, that's the Pope. He's the leader of the Catholic Church, the leader, you know, the beast. And his number is 666, as we just went through. Um, as a, as a, uh, in, in context for, for following on from this, those who do not receive the mark are the 144,000, which I think is next lesson's study, next week's study, uh, Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5. They do not receive the mark of the beast. And then... Um, the three angels um, in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, are basically these three warning messages sent to the world to warn the world of what is to come. The, uh, in verses 6 and 7, there's the first angel that proclaims the gospel and points people back to the Sabbath in verse 7 and proclaims the judgment. Then... Um, as a result of rejecting the first the first angel's message, the second message in verse 8 says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And basically Babylon um, Babylon represents um, uh, various um, it represents Church. It represents churches who have to who have rejected the first angel's message. So it's like you've heard the first angel's message in verse seven about the judgment and about the Sabbath and about the gospel and about the true worship of God. And when that message is rejected, then the church becomes Babylon. All in fallen and the wine uh the wine uh, represents false doctrine um there's a reference for that in isaiah 28 uh, the wine represents deception um the third angel in verse 9 is this third message which warns against the worship of the beast the worship of the image of the beast and the mark of the beast uh, so it's the worship of the Catholic Church in the acknowledgement of the keeping of Sunday. It's a, a warning against the worship of the image. This is the idea that the church can control the state. And it's a warning against the reception of the mark in the right hand or the forehead. And the mark of the beast is the keeping of Sunday in place of the Sabbath which is by the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And essentially it says that if, if the Bible says if, that those who hear these three messages and it ends up rejecting their counsel and actually ends up worshipping the beast and receiving the mark and worshipping the image, that God's wrath will be poured out without mercy and they will be it says tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb so very strong language here um but uh, i know that uh, the series on the millennium was one of the previous studies uh, and in revelation 20 we have the um, you know the fire but when the 
during the second resurrection, they come up, come up uh, the, all the lost, they come up and surround the city and fire comes out of God and destroys them. I think that this is what this reference is here. That they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Because that's when it's actually going to happen uh, after the second resurrection. Um, and then in verse 12, there's this contrast um, as to God's true people. And it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so there's this contrast presented here between these two chapters. On the one hand, there's the beast, there's this false system, and then there's uh, the second beast, the USA, that says supporting this false system uh, and instituting the image of the beast. And in contrast to all of this, there's this small group of people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. And the Bible in the book of Revelation is, is essentially encouraging us to keep the commandments of God and to keep the faith of Jesus Christ. Um, doing everything that Jesus would do, loving people as Jesus would love them, and teaching the truth as Jesus would teach it. And um, this is in contrast with those who receive the mark of the beast. And I think that's sort of like a, a nice place to end our study for today. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Um, you've provided so much details. There was a comment here uh, in the chat that says the information and cross references you are presenting is fascinating. Um, so thank you so much for all that um, detail and information, Pull it, pulling it together so that we could clearly see um, what the mark of the beast is and the warning that God has given against receiving it. Um, Amen. Yeah, and the conclusion to the lesson says, in the most startling prophecy over the Bible ever, the Bible predicts that church and state will unite under the banner of Satan. As calamities and disasters continue to mount, one can see how the world will respond to return once again to God, and with that, a mandate for total community worship on Sunday, the mark of the beast. So we're going to see calamities happen that um, the state and the church, the state will use to impose um, Sunday as a day of worship upon the entire world. And America will be used to ensure that that happens. Um, America has the greatest military power on earth and they will be using their might um, to bring about this enforcement. But God is um, calling us to him now before all that happens. Last week, we look at the fact that he says to seal us in, his, in our forehead. That is to seal us as his through the power of the Holy Spirit and through showing our love to him by keeping his commandments, including his commandments. And he says, God, however, will not bring the end of the world without first providing all, the, all with knowledge of his messages as well as a way of escape. So by providing this knowledge beforehand, God is giving us a chance to choose him uh, so that that will provide us a way of escape from receiving the mark of the beast. With this knowledge in mind, Sabbath becomes much more than an alternative day to worship. I'm sure you're beginning to see that. It becomes a symbol for loyalty to God or to Satan. So my question to us here, do we want to receive God's symbol of loyalty you know, by worshiping God on his true day of worship so that we can show our loyalty to God and not to Satan. I mean, how many of us want to remain loyal to God? Amen. How many of us Amen. do that indicate? By yes, we have Doreen, we have Malika, 
Robert just says amen that he wants to indicate his loyalty to God by observing uh, the Sabbath commandment, not just simply as a day, but as an expression of our loyalty uh, to God. I certainly want to do that. I want to be on God's side. I thank him for providing all this um, knowledge so that we are able to make the right choice before the four winds of strife are let loose and we are under immense pressure. If we choose God today, then he will protect us um, throughout the time of trouble. I can see Shimmery's hand as well, and I can see a Malika's hand as well. Also, there's an opportunity for those who have not yet um, followed Jesus into baptism. Um, there is a baptism that is being planned. So if you want to be baptized, please just indicate to me and I will pass your name on to pastor so that you can be prepared to follow Jesus uh, into baptism. So just want to bring this um, uh, session to an end uh, with a word of prayer. And we just ask Robert if he could just close in prayer for us. Amen. Um, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for uh, the privilege of leading us in this study. Um, Lord, I know that uh, uh, the wisdom is not mine, but it is yours. And Lord, we just want to thank you for um, uh, being with us today. Uh, we want to pray, Lord, um, that you would enable us to follow you and to obey Jesus and to live for you. As it says that we should keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Lord, we know that in order to really keep, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we have to have this daily relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, for each person here that you would help us personally to connect to you and to understand what it means to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Teach us more, Lord, about the faith of Jesus and help us to have the kind of faith that Jesus had the kind of faith that Jesus had allows him to perform miracles and to, 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 to really trust in the protection of our Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord, that you would bring us to that point where we can have that full dependency on you so that we will be enabled to resist um, the mark and name and image of the beast. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert, for sparing us your time. I know you're a busy person. So we are very um, privileged and pleased to have you uh, share your knowledge uh, with us. And as you said, next week, um, we will be covering um, the 144,000. That's lesson 23. So if you could go through that and come and um, uh, come together so that we can identify who are these 144,000, how can we be amongst them so that we will not receive the mark of the beast because this group of people will not receive the mark of the beast. So let's find out who Amen. they are and how through, uh, through the revelation that God has given to us that we can become part of that number. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I know this is quite a, a, a very heavy topic, a very involved topic, uh, and that's why I'm so glad I could call on Robert to help to, do, to present that topic. And then uh, hopefully next week we can come back together. Come early, please. Come on time, because the, the earlier you come is the sooner we can finish as well. Okay, so remember to come early next week. Same time, same place. Yeah, I appreciate that. I picked up a few things there that, you know, as I'll always, uh, I do find this topic quite a big one. So I'm really calling on other people to help me out uh, when we come to it. So that was absolutely great. Praise God. Uh, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased, pleased I could I could be of service. Yeah, I appreciate that. We I hope, hope, hope it went well enough. I hope, because I get, I hope I didn't lose, lose people. <laughs> Yeah, so what you know, I would so there was one comment in the chat. Oh, is it still there? So the information and cross 
references you are presenting is fascinating. Yeah, I think I think that was a positive one. That was when I, as you've made that comment, when I was doing Revelation, uh, when I was bringing in Romans thirteen, or just just before that, and linking it to the uh, the sword, uh, how the sword is the state power, 